Take it out. Okay. Uh, hi, this is uh, Alan Blumkin, uh, the host of uh, Old Time Baseball History and Trivia. And uh, today uh, I'm with Ralph Pico and uh, possibly David Nemec. And our guest today is Jeremy Lerman, who wrote a book uh, that's currently out and probably doing very, very well at this point. Uh, on the uh, Most Valuable Player Award. Welcome, Jeremy. Oh, thank you so much for having me, guys. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here with you. Oh, a pleasure to have you. You're a former Alamedan, if nothing else. I am a former Alamedan, former Bay Area resident, and current resident of Hoboken, New Jersey, which some people will tell you is the uh, birthplace of baseball, but don't uh, don't don't take that. Was it baseball? Wasn't Frank from Hoboken as well? Frank was indeed from Hoboken, and in fact, I will be on Sinatra Drive later today. So yes, our, our two biggest claims to fame are Frank, or Mr. Sinatra, as we say, uh, and right. uh, Elysian Field, the birthplace of baseball. Yeah, I just finished watching from here eternity, which is on TCM for the. You know, ten thousandth time. So uh, you know, so after won an Oscar for that. Oh, yeah, that's a and terrific that's, movie. Rejuvenated yeah, I've seen it a number of times. It was on today because it's Pearl Harbor Day today. Oh yeah, man, I mean, I, Pearl yeah. Harbor. I thought it was Pearl Bailey. No, it wasn't. No, it was Pearl Harbor Day today. That's Pearl yes. Harbor Day. Okay. That's why they showed the uh, from Air Eternity. Okay. That. uh Terrific movie. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and rest in peace, both Pearl and Louis Belson, as a matter of fact, ladies and yeah. gentlemen. Um, yeah, Frank was something else. Do you have any He won an Oscar. He, 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 he got the best picture of the year, and he uh, and Donna Reed got supporting actor and actress. And I think Clifton and uh, Lancaster were both nominated for best actor and uh, Deborah Carr for best actress, but they didn't win. Okay, that's some uh, terrific trivia. When I yeah, I'm not, no, I'm not good on that stuff, but that one I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, you know, maybe you can start on uh, getting Jeremy's take on the recent American League MVP, because they gave it to Mike Trout, who uh, played on a team that was 74 and 88, and... Uh, it's very hard for somebody like me to understand how they can give an MVP to a player on a team that's not very good. Well, I'm happy to talk about that because I I, I thought that's a great a great topic to to start. Um, and Alan, you represent a point of view which I'm very interested uh, in, in getting as well, and that is the notion that a, a player from a last place team. Uh, how valuable can they be if their team wasn't in contention? And the Angels this year, as you pointed out, they were terrible. Well, I happen to think that the Mike Trout MVP was a fabulous vote. Um, but for maybe a reason that's not, not – uh, for, for a reason perhaps you don't agree with, but I'd like to get your take, and that's this. Um, Mike Trout's clearly the best player in baseball. Now – I would actually written an article from my website predicting uh, who I or, – or, or giving my opinion on who I thought was going to be named MVP this year. And I thought it was going to be Mookie Betts of the Boston Red Sox. Betts was a fabulous player. Uh, the Red Sox were a winning team. Uh, I don't think that Mookie Betts is as valuable to his team as Mike Trout is to the Angels because Mike Trout, I think, is a better baseball player than Mookie Betts. Mookie Betts is a wonderful player, however, and if he would have been named MVP, it would have been a perfectly fine vote. Um, it would have caused some controversy because there is a, a very vocal online crowd uh, of baseball fans uh, who believe that Mike Trout, as the best player, and he's really been the best player since the, since the moment he stepped on the field five years ago, that Mike Trout should be named MVP every year because he's the best player. Well, we know it doesn't work that way. If it worked that way, it wouldn't be a very interesting award, would it? We would never have anything to argue about. We would just look at the statistics and determine who, did that, who had the best year, and they'd be named MVP. But in this case, in this case, I think the voters got it right. I was very glad to be 
wrong with my prediction of Mookie Betts. And it's because if you look at relative value, let's say that Mookie Betts was worth, and we'll just we'll just make this up. Let's say Mookie Betts over the course of the season was worth ten wins to the Boston Red Sox with his bat, with his glove, with his leg. Let's say he was worth about ten wins to the Boston Red Sox. If you look at Mike Trout, let's say he was worth ten wins to the California Angels. Okay, about comparable. Let's say they're both about the same in terms of value. Well. You could say, well, Mookie Betts' 10 wins put Boston over the hump and got them first place and got them into the playoffs. What did Mike Trout's 10 wins do for the Angels, who only won, I think, 74 74, games? yeah. They won 74 yeah. and 88. Yeah. And if they didn't have Mike Trout, then maybe they would have won 64 games. They still would have finished in last place. But, but, and I suspect you might not agree with this, if you look at the relative value you could take the point of view that Mike Trout's 10 wins comprised a larger percentage of California's overall success than Mookie Betts' 10 wins for Boston's overall success. I was just thinking, success. you're absolutely correct. The wins are it's, more it's significant. The, the wins are more significant. Um, That's Bill James' win shares you're talking about, basically, right? Uh, it's, it's along the same lines. I'm, 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 in this case, I'm thinking of wins above replacement, but it's the same deal. You know, it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's kind of a, a new – now, but I will say this. I will, you know, again, it's, it, it kind of is the same argument as to why penalize a player because his teammates weren't very good. You know, Mookie Betts had a much better team around him. He had, uh, uh, David Ortiz, he had a much stronger pitching staff. You know, he had the, the wonderful second baseman, Dustin Pedroia, Hanley Ramirez. This is a powerhouse lineup and a powerhouse team. The Angels, it's Mike Trout, and, I, and, and no disrespect to the major leaguers who were trying. It's Mike Trout and 23 other guys. So in that regard, I completely understand why Mike Trout was named. Again, it was a surprise because, uh, as you know, traditionally, uh, players on last place teams, they don't get named MVP. It's only happened a handful of times in the entire history of the award. And, in fact, more than 90%, I think it's, it's actually more than 95% uh, of all MVP winners, if you look over the history of the award, they come from winning teams, and the majority of that, they come from playoff teams. So I do Is understand Hank Sauer the one of those who... Yeah, a great call. Hank Sauer was, he, he was one of the earliest ones to break the mold. He He was named MVP, I believe it was 1952. Yeah. or something like that. And he beat out Robin Roberts, who won 28 games that year. Exactly. And that yeah. was a terrible selection. Hank Sauer was a terrible selection. I know that. Robin Roberts was, was the best player in the league that year. Now, Sauer played for a team, I believe the Cubs went 77 and 77 that year. Now, yeah, you're Cubs, right. That yeah. was pretty good, right? Um, that was pretty good for the Cubs. For the Cubs, was right. Place. Yeah, for the Cubs. He, he, he was named MVP. He led the league in home runs and RBI, and he was an affable guy. People liked him. But he was nowhere near the most valuable player in the league that year. There were several players on several better teams. Stan Musial, Jackie Robinson, Robin Roberts. All these guys would have been better picks uh, than Sauer. Um, so, he again, it, it, it happens. It's rare. Um the Mike Trout selection to me, again, I, I thought it was great. Um, however, I don't think there was really a wrong choice this year if they had picked that. I mean, uh, Alan, who would you have selected as MVP if you were voting? Um, probably, I uh, probably would have voted for Betts. But yeah. uh, that's basically because, you know, the, the old Branch Ricky line about Ralph Kiner uh, when he went in and asked yeah. for the race, he says, we finished last with, with you, we could finish last without you. Uh, the one I had, the trap one I had real problems with was when the, a lot of people were pushing him uh, a few years ago over um, uh, Miggy Cabrera, who had won the Triple Crown and gotten his team into the World Series, which they would never have made without, the uh, Tigers would never have made the World Series without Cabrera that season. No way. And they were pushing Trout again, uh yeah, you know, even though he, he you know, he's, he may be doomed, uh, like, uh, Ralph Kyer to be playing on a team that's never going to go anywhere. 
Yeah, you know, I feel I feel bad for him. You know, you know, as much as you can bad, feel bad for somebody making you know twenty million dollars a year that he's stuck on a team that uh, you know, was, uh, you know, from what I understand, has a very bad farm system and is really not going to go anywhere for a long time. Oh, he'll he'll there be. There are yeah, rumors that he might be traded. Yeah, he'll be he'll be wearing Yankee pinstripes in a few years. I'm not another one I wanted to uh, 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 Jeremy. Another another one I wanted to mention before we got in the air was Zoyo Versailles because I, I I was of the opinion that uh, Tony Oliva should have won it that year for uh, Minnesota. You know, Zoilo is probably, and again, not to be unkind, he's probably the worst player to, in terms of a career. Oh yeah, that's why I mentioned it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, but that year, I don't think he was the worst selection. Uh, Oliva certainly was was a, a, an absolutely fabulous hitter. I mean, people I think today don't remember just how great he was before his knees just completely betrayed him. Um, but he was a wonderful, wonderful hitter. He was a line drive machine. The year that Zoilo won, 1965, he actually had a hell of a year. Um, he was solid in the field that year too. And he was an excellent defender in the field. That's absolutely right, right Ralph. And the Twins unexpectedly had a great finish. I, I, I think, I think, I'm not entirely sure. Alan, you would know maybe. It's, I think they took the uh, the pennant that year. Uh, yeah, yeah. So Pilbrew was... missed a good portion of that, uh, that uh, season with a hamstring. So that's why he wasn't uh, you know, even uh, considered. And, and that may have contributed deep, though, to the value of yeah. Yeah. Okay, that was, Dad, that was a good team. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I Earl, Batty, Earl, was, Earl Batty, who always showed up on winning teams, for some reason, a very underrated player, um, was the catcher on that team. And my feeling is, and they had guys that hit for short periods. Of, Castro was on that team, if I remember. Jimmy Hall, yeah. Bob Allison. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, but Dick, Richie Rollins, Rollins and yeah. Allen were just breaking in, and they were. Yeah, but uh, uh, Oliva uh, was, uh, you know, he was tremendous. Uh, as Jeremy said, he was tremendous until his knees, uh, his knees went. And that shortened yeah, his oh, career. Yeah. He was Hall of Fame level up to that point. Absolutely. Yeah, no, a- absolutely. But but I would say looking back at the MVP vote that year, I don't think Zoilo was a bad choice. For that year, he never did anything again in his career. Though I mean, he had some injuries. He also had just some, from what I understood, uh, based on some of the research I did, he also had some attitude problems. Um, uh, he was not really known on his team as as a. He was known as kind of a little bit of a selfish player or somebody who was seeking out, uh, you know, wondering why he wasn't getting the credit that say Louis Aparicio was getting and, and things of that nature. Um, but again. He had his great year, and then he got hurt, and then he just kind of languished for a couple of years. A few years after that, he then he just disappeared. Um, it was his one good. It, it was his one great year. He had, he had a decent year in '64, but certainly not an MVP level year. '65 uh, was was one and done, as they say, for Zoilo. Uh, Jeremy, did you discuss uh, Ted Williams in your book? Yeah, Ted Williams. Is, okay, because the two the times he won the Triple Crown, uh, yeah, they gave it to Joe Gordon in 1942 and DiMaggio in 47. And uh, Williams had they such sure a period, period year to DiMaggio that season that, uh, you know, just uh, I know, you know, his, of his relationship with uh, some of the uh, Boston Riders. And I think that is, you feel that that's what cost him those two MVPs. Well, so a couple of things on on the Ted Williams uh, uh, seasons that you just mentioned. Uh, First, I actually devoted an entire chapter. The the chapter is called Sticking It to the Splinter, Most Career MVP Snubs. In other words, who were the players that were passed over the most often and in the worst way uh, by the MVP voters? And there were three. And they are three of the greatest players uh, of all time. It's Willie Mays, Ted Williams, and Mickey Mantle. And you're absolutely right. Uh, I count Williams as he won two awards. Uh, he should have won probably five or six, but I, I, I pegged the number at five. And in my estimation, he was snubbed three times. One was a minor snub, and the other two were terrible. They were egregious snubs. 
Um, you mentioned 42 and 47. He won the Triple Crown both years. And 1941, obviously. Well, the match, they gave it to the match because of the streak. They gave it to the match. Yeah. Because, yeah, because of the, but all, you know, but, but you can understand that. So the, the yeah. nature of the, of, of the book, so the, the, the title of the book is, is Baseball's Most Baffling MVP. Yeah, I know that, yeah. And what I was trying to get at was what were the conditions of the game at the time during these votes and what may have influenced these votes. And obviously DiMaggio, 56-game hitting streak. He also hit 357 that year. He, he drove in 125 runs to lead the league. He had a fantastic season. He had a wonderful season. Ted Williams hit 400. Was he a better hitter? Yes. But as you both know, Ted Williams uh, was an indifferent defender and an indifferent base runner. I mean, he used to practice his batting stroke in front of the Green Monster in left field <laughs> between pitches, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. Because you know, I think he once said that that was just a place to be on the field between at bats. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. So you know, that the brings us to Martinez's place, Edgar Martinez's place on the Hall of Fame ballot. I don't believe. He was a complete player, being uh, DH for much of his career. And, um, well, that's not going to really become an issue until what he's is eligible. Well, that's true. well, well. Edgar has been has uh, I think what's he? He's at least five or six years into his uh, yeah into his tenure on the ballot, right? And he hasn't he hasn't uh, gotten much support. I. Uh, I'm a little torn, but I, I hate to say it, but I lean, Ralph, I, I, I agree with you, um, and it's not fair to Edgar Martinez. Uh, he would played the role that he was paid to play. Um, he's a Hall of Fame hitter. There's no doubt about that. But no doubt. I don't believe that a full-time DH uh, should be in the Hall. Uh, I, I Ortiz will I be an exception because he was such an – Big fours came up so big in, you know, playoffs, World Series. Yeah, let's get back uh, to the MVPs. Yeah, I don't think we're, we're here okay. to discuss Hall of Fame. Let's go back to the MVPs. Okay. Make everybody more comfortable. <laughs> Hall of Fame, you can talk forever. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we, we, we can talk about anything you guys want to talk about. I'm, 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 okay. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm another, having a great time. Another couple of ones that uh, I, I, I questioned was uh, were. Uh, uh, Banks over Henry Aaron in 1959, and uh, Campanella over Duke Snyder in 1955. Well, I, so very quickly on both, and I, I did I did not. Oh, I'm sorry, Ralph. Were you were you breaking in? No, I was just saying good questions, Al. The, terrific. Yeah, the, the Banks MVP over Aaron was. Again, it was the Cubs. They were not a successful team. Uh, Banks was obviously the far and away the best player on the Cubs. He was one of the two or three best players in the league that year. Yeah, I know. Um, I know yeah. He had a, a, a wonderful year. Aaron, of course, was Aaron. He had a wonderful year every year. Um, <laughs> you know, Hank Aaron only only claimed one MVP over his career, and it's yeah, kind of a shame. 1957, it, yeah, fifty-seven, nineteen fifty-seven. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a shame. Um, uh, I mean, er, was Ernie Banks a great player that year? He was. Uh, yes. Could Hank Aaron have won it? Absolutely. Willie Mays could have won it as well. Um, now, the Campanella over Snyder is to me a little bit more interesting in the sense that uh, Snyder was was the best player on the team. Uh, that year. Um, but, you know, this was an era in the 50s where, you know, uh, uh, Campanella, between Roy Campanella and Yogi Berra, we had two New York catchers who claimed six MVPs uh, in the span of five or six years. Well, um, Yogi won just, 54 because they split the uh, Cleveland vote. Yeah, and, and so the writers had a real respect uh, and fascination for catchers during this decade, by the way, which I think has been lost over the decades. I think catchers deserve more respect than they get uh, in the voting. Uh, these days, of course, you, you have your exceptions. Buster Posey won not too long ago and, and Pud Rodriguez. Um, but they really respected the grind that, the, that these guys put in. Now, look, was Duke Snyder more valuable to his team that year uh, than Roy Campanella? He was. 
He was. Um, I don't have – Alan, you, probably, you have an encyclopedic knowledge. You don't have the statistics at hand. But, I mean, this may have been the year – one of the years that Duke Snyder hit 40 home runs and drove in well yeah. over 100 and hit yeah. over 300. Yeah. Um, he played a fantastic center field. Um, you know, there's, there's no case against Duke Snyder. Uh, it, it was really a case of – you know, Campanella wasn't the best choice. There's, there's no other way to put it. it. It really should have been Snyder. Well, okay. he was Snyder was a petulant uh, person with the, with the press, and uh, Campy was very gregarious and open. And hey, the press is made up of human beings. They go to work every day like everybody else, and if they're treated like shit, they're going to respond in kind, and that's the way they come back. That's what happened in Boston with Ted Williams. My God, they hated him. But he fueled the fire. He hated them, and there were several of them who were right, uh, back and forth. Who started up with him right away, you know, because he wouldn't count to them. And yeah, one of the he, one of the worst was a writer named Dave Egan, who uh, was an absolute drunk, and who was the he, Egan hated Casey Stengel, and when Stengel was hired by the Yankees, he said the only thing they're going to get from Stengel is a lot of laughs. But uh, anyway, uh, he got that uh, wrong. He got that one wrong. Right? I know. Oh, yeah. yeah, slightly. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, another well, one I want to bring up is the uh, Run Guidry Jim Rice in 1978. Okay, you guys have. Now, I didn't have a problem. I didn't have a problem with <laughs> Rice getting that, but I just want to, uh, to you know you discuss that one if you can. Sure. Yeah. Do we have a couple of minutes? Is this one, yeah. this one we I've have as long as you want. Let's let her go. <laughs> I just want to interject every now and again. We're on the comfortably zoned radio network, and uh, we have Alan Blumkin. And um, why don't you pronounce your name, Jeremy? Jeremy Lehrman. Lehrman. All right, yes. Jeremy. And you're in Hoboken, New Jersey. You wrote a book. And it's called? Baseball's Most Baffling MVP Ballots. Now, where can people get this book? They can get it anywhere that they find books online. So all the usual big places. But also, I would encourage people to check out, you know, any so any independent uh, online booksellers would also be a great place to find it. You, you could also and how can it people, how can people get in touch with you personally, your website or... Um, oh sure, yeah. There's two. yeah several ways. So I also uh, run a website dedicated to baseball, baseball writing. It's called PlateCoverage.com. That's PlateCoverage.com. They can also okay. find me on Twitter, uh, Plate underscore Coverage.com, and by my name, Jeremy underscore Lehrman uh, at Twitter. And uh, also Facebook, all the usual stuff, Ralph. So, and I'm very, I'm, I, I love hearing from baseball fans and people who have an, a, an opinion one way or the other. You want to tell me you love my book? Great. You want to tell me you hated my book? Great. Let's talk about it. <laughs> so, right. I encourage any of you. Tell me what, just to tell me why. <laughs> that, uh, exactly. Exactly. You, you can have a good reason, but just don't hate it because the cover's blue. <laughs> right. <Red. laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. As long as you say, as long, look, look, I can live with it. I didn't like chapter three because I didn't like your opinion on on this, that, and everything. That's great. I got I got to tell you something. Yes. We do a show, Alan and I, with Peter Golenbach. Oh, and, wonderful um, writer. Uh, yes, absolutely. We're privileged to have have uh, a bunch of folks on this network that uh, are tremendously passionate and talented. But my point is, um, I post the show on several baseball sites on Facebook. And somebody writes in, he says, you know, Peter Golenbach, I wish you would get a fact, a comment to the posting. I wish you would get a fact checker. He spelled Bill Mazeroski's name wrong. He spelled it blah, blah, blah. So wait a second. He wrote nine bestsellers in yeah. the New York Times, <laughs> he, he and like all you have to career. do is that he wrote Dynasty and Bums. Yeah. And, uh, oh yeah. Well, uh, anybody and, who's and and he and somebody spelled Masaroski wrong. They put a W in there. Yeah. You got to say. You have to say. In other words, 
please, why do you waste the clicks? Why do you waste the Internet with something like that? I couldn't believe it. I didn't know how to respond to to something like that. Um, oh, I, sure, I can't believe it. We want criticism, now. but for yeah. the right reasons. Um, exactly. Look, you can say to me, I didn't like your book. Just don't say, I didn't like your book, and I think you're ugly. That's uncalled for, right? Just, <laughs> let's just right. be professional. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you think uh, since the advent of the uh, – uh, double Cy Young in 1967 that uh, pitchers should be uh, eligible for the MVP? I absolutely do. Um, and I think that pitchers have been criminally, particularly in the National League, particularly in the National League, have been criminally underrepresented since 1967. So you, you picked a great year, right? So the Cy Young, uh, uh, it was given as one award for both leagues, beginning, I think, in 1956, the first yeah, with Newcomb, Newcomb, yeah. who also, by the way, was named MVP that year of the National yeah. League. Uh, Gibson obviously won it in 1968, Yeah. Uh, MVP we're talking about. And then that was it in the National League until Clayton Kershaw in 2014. That was it. Uh, Co- didn't Cole Fox got it in 1963? Oh, uh, uh, I think it was. 63. Yeah. 63. Yeah. The yeah. last, prior to, to uh, Kershaw in 2014, yeah. it was Gibson. That's 45 years, 46 yeah. years to be exact. Now, over that period of time, and I know that there are voters who, who just simply will not grant that a pitcher who takes the mound in today's game 33 times a year can be as valuable as somebody who takes uh, the field 150 times a year. And if you're not going to be convinced otherwise, that's okay. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. But what you can't say to me with a straight face, really, is that Dwight Gooden in 1985 wasn't the most valuable player in baseball. He was the most valuable commodity in baseball. He was the most important person in baseball, and he was the best player. Nobody was more valuable than Dwight Gooden was to the 1985 Mets. Now, they, asked, they fell short that year in their pennant drive. The, the Cardinals famously took, uh, took the NL East and went on to the World Series. And a Cardinal, Willie McGee, who had a nice year, uh, hit 350, played a decent center field, stole a ton of bases, uh, had a very nice year, was named MVP. Dwight Gooden, with all due respect to Willie McGee, was twice the player, not just of Willie McGee, but of essentially any other player in the National League that year. You can say the same for Greg Maddox in 1994 or 1995. Uh, now, in 1994, Jeff Bagwell was named NL MVP, and he deserved it. My God, he had a historic year. 1995, Greg Maddox went 19-2 and two with an ERA somewhere along the lines of 1.63. He was the most valuable player in baseball. He was named Cy Young, I think unanimously so. Did not get a lot of MVP support. Went to Barry Larkin that year. You know who came in second that year? Dante Bichette. Oh, God. Dante Bichette. <laughs> oh, my God. Ahead of Greg Maddox. Ahead of Greg Maddox. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I think pitchers have been screwed <laughs> over the years. Um, sure. In the American League, they had this weird fascination in the 80s, but give it, they gave relievers the MVP every yeah. couple of years. Uh, which, uh, Fingers and uh, Willie Hernandez. Willie Hernandez, and then a couple of years, 1992, Dennis Eckersley. I yeah. strongly disagree with that. I think that's mm. criminal. I don't think a reliever should ever be in the in the uh, conversation. But I also know some folks uh, who believe other. In fact, Alan, you may know I, I had the privilege and the pleasure. I uh, gave a, it was I had a book signing at this wonderful shop in New York City, the Bergino Baseball Club. Yeah, I know where that is. Yeah, My, you know, I used to go there, but. Uh, um, I, uh, I'm uh, pretty much housebound right now. Uh, well, I'm, so, I'm sorry to hear. I hope when you're back. Yeah, you're well, it's, it's, it's a long, long-standing problem. It doesn't affect me mentally. <laughs> no, clearly not. <laughs> yeah. No, clearly not is right. It's clearly not. And hey, guys, I have a theory. If yeah. they extended the um, – if they didn't have the voting until after the completion of the playoffs in the World Series – would the awards be more subjective than they are or more objective than they are now? Because, um, yeah, because. I, I, I think the answer is, is yes, and I think meaning that it would impact and influence the awards for sure, and I think that's why 
they wisely decided, uh, I believe it was after the 1926 season, uh, they wisely decided, and I, and I, I may have to double check that, um, that the deadline for submitting the awards was before the playoffs, and in those days the World Series, before they began, because it was meant to be a regular season award. It's for sure, um, if a player has a, an historic World Series, and by the way, you, you can make, it's a valid argument, you know, um, you can argue, um, you know, if a player hits uh, the game-winning home run in the, the deciding game of the World Series, bottom of the ninth, game seven, well, yeah, isn't the whole purpose of, of playing baseball to win the World Series? There's nothing more valuable than that. This, the player absolutely was the most valuable player, uh, you know, in that context for, for the year. Yeah, like, but if somebody – but, no, I, I – if it's close, like with the uh, – you guys are talking about Robin Roberts being close yeah, to somebody, yeah. then it can be determined, but not if it's some pinch hitter, Dale Mitchell sure. comes up. No, 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 you're – yeah, I was being a little flippant, but you're absolutely right. Uh, if, no. Um, you know, it, it, it could. It could absolutely. And, and I think it's a good thing. Um, well, uh, look, I shouldn't say it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's it's that the definition of the award is for the regular season. If right. it was different, um, if if they included postseason, um, then it's just, then the parameters of the award are, are, are a little different. And yes, I, I, and I think it, it changes the nature of the vote. And you're absolutely right. I absolutely think it, it could be a uh, deciding factor. And is that fair? Let's, let's say. It's unfair to the MVP of the playoffs in the World Series also. Um, exactly. Well, basically, you, you could have uh, guys like Brian Doyle in 1978. I mean, the guy was a non-entity in the regular season. They became a World Series hero. Yep. So you can have guys like that who don't do anything. Uh, Billy Martin, for example, was a, a 250, 260 hitter during the regular season. In the World Series, he ramped it up about 100 notches, and he had a career yeah. World Series average of 333. That's right. So, I mean, uh, there's Billy no Martin way in the played. world you would name Billy Martin the, the MVP of the league during the regular season. Billy Martin shared an agent with Jackie Robinson, and they had a friendly co- competition going. No, Robinson, uh, yeah, played Robinson friendly. in every World Series, but, yeah. Not, yeah, well, right. Uh, Not all that friendly. No. But he took a, a lot of pride yeah. in the fact that he did come up in those big games. Yeah, there were several and, guys that uh, over the years that were able to you know, have ordinary regular seasons, and they'd ramp it up in the postseason for – one reason or another, they were able to do that. Martin was one of them. And I'm eight, nine, ten years old with a Billy Martin glove, and he's yeah. doing these things in the World Series, and uh, that was cool beans, gentlemen. No, yeah, Billy Jeremy, Martin. Do you, do you address anything before the uh, BB uh, baseball writers, uh, the ones they had in the 20s, where if you won it once, you couldn't, uh, went, you yeah. weren't eligible to win it again? Oh. Yes, they, I, I, I devote an entire chapter actually to kind of retroactively awarding MVP awards in those seasons where the award wasn't given or, as you pointed out, the rules of the voting were so silly. Yeah, that it's stupid, yeah. It's totally stupid. So what, what for our listeners, what I was referring to is that the American League introduced a version of the award in 1922 and it ran for seven seasons. And one of the reasons that the award failed, but just one, there are others, was the rules of the voting, which stated, one, that a player could only win the award once over the course of their career, which meant, among other things, that Babe Ruth, Babe Ruth, only won, was only named MVP once, um, only went it once over a career. The second thing was the player managers, which were, were common in those days, player managers were not eligible. And the third thing was that a writer could only vote for one player per team. So imagine this. Uh, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig were teammates. Um, you could only vote for one. You weren't able to say Babe Ruth should be, I vote, I put him in the first place and I put Lou Gehrig, I give him my second place vote. You weren't allowed to do that under the rules of the time. So the award was essentially meaningless. Um, the National League introduced their version of the award in 1924. They didn't have any of these silly rules, 
So it was much more representative of the award that we know today. Um, both awards came to their end. The American League of 1929, uh, or sorry, the 1928 season, the National League of 1929, basically for two reasons. One, they never caught on with the public because of the silly rules. But two, this is back in the day when the owners had all the power. Players had no negotiating power whatsoever other than to say uh, that I'm going to sit out the season. Um, and they had to do this every single year, as you guys well know. Every year it was oh, yeah. peace for a player to get anything. So what players would do is they would say, hey, I, I'm the most valuable player in the league. I deserve a raise. And if they weren't the most valuable player in the league, they would say, hey, that guy was named the most valuable player. I had a season just as good, so I won a raise. Well, the owners decided, you know what, we're not going in for any of this because we don't want to give this leverage to these players. Um, and they decided to can the awards. Um, and luckily, it was they were brought back in 1931, and that's when the Baseball Writers Association of America kind of took ownership of the award um, under the the, the uh, watchful eye, I should say, or, or, or with the endorsement of uh, Kennesaw Mountain Land as the all-powerful commissioner at the time. Um, and, and the award as we know it today was really founded in 1931. Okay. How many awards would Babe Ruth ha- would have won had he that rule of – you can only win one. Yeah, weren't in effect. It, my opinion in the chapter that I wrote about this was that Ruth would have, should have. Let's put it this way: if there were any justice in the world, uh, he would have won at least seven and as many as nine, um, which would have been the all-time record, of course, which is now held by Barry Bonds, who won seven awards. And no other player has more than three, so it's pretty remarkable. Right. Um, I know that Alan's blood just curled a little bit. Yeah, Bond's yeah. Reference. Oh, look, Am I yeah, right? basically, uh, yeah, he was at that point. And, uh, you know, one of the ones that I thought even, uh, three years ago was when, uh, I'm a pi- I root for the Pirates, which is a, uh, <laughs> is a punishment in itself. And <laughs> yeah. when they get, when they gave it to, uh, McCutcheon, uh, three years ago, I thought that the MVP that year should have been Yadier Molina. Because you made the point about catchers. Yeah. And yeah. he, and, and he not only did very great. well offensively, but he was a terrific, terrific catcher. Yeah, but there, you know, there's really no case against Molina. Um, I think this is 2013, was it, yeah. when McCutcheon won? Yeah. 2013, so in 2012 and 2013, uh, because uh, Molina, I think, came in second, maybe, or second or third. High. He, he finished high in the rankings uh, behind Buster Posey in 2012. Uh, he was a fabulous player, and, and uh, I think it was, like, uh, just kind of luck of the draw, you know. Uh, McCutcheon had a very nice overall season. Molina had an excellent season as well. Um, and I think the Pirates, that was the year where they finally broke through. They finally right? broke through 20 years of losing, yeah. 20 years uh, since they had been in the playoffs. 20 years since uh, Sydney they had, since, left yeah, the since, bases. Yeah, since 1992, okay. where both Drybeck and Bonds left, uh, left as free agents after that season. Yeah, yeah. What was uh, that? Uh, Bream slides or something like that? Uh, Bream, yeah, with his mad dash around third yeah, base. Yeah, well, uh, don't remind me of that one. Yeah, he was because really when the when televising the Braves game on TBS uh, back in the, in 1993, every time they opened, they showed that play, and I got me it got me nauseous. Yeah, but what are you going to do? Well, yeah, he he he, uh, he was about as fast uh, as a glacier. He was, yeah, was, was, was as, yes. as a glacier melts. What you th- oh, Jeremy? What do you think of the 1978 one between uh, Jim Rice and Ron Guidry? Uh, so yeah, so let's return to that. that yeah. We brought that up earlier. Uh, so, uh, full disclosure, although it has absolutely no no impact or influence whatsoever on my opinion on who, who should or shouldn't be MVP, uh, I grew up as a Yankee fan. Uh, and I I came uh, I became a Yankee fan. Uh, I was giving away my age when I was six years old. Uh, like any kid in New York at the time who was impressionable with Reggie Jackson, and his heroics in the World Series, and that sealed me as a Yankee fan. No, now, after 19, that, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I am jealous and and envious of that. And 
So 1978, as you alluded to, Jim Rice and Ron Guidry were the top two finishers uh, in the MVP race, with Jim Rice winning the award. Now, Rice had, uh, at, on the surface, a monumental year. Um, the listeners can check his statistics, but, but he, he, he basically led the league in, in most of the important offensive categories, with the exception of batting average. He had 406 um, total bases, which... To me well, 406 uh, total bases, which, yeah. is, which hadn't been done in since the Henry Aaron. League. In 1959, yeah. got, well, I got 400. That was the first time since the Stan Musial did it in 1948. Yeah, it was, so he had, he, had a, he had a monumental year. Uh, Ron Can we get you on the $64,000 question now? I applied for that years ago, and <laughs> long story short, it okay. It doesn't. Mm. Surprise me. You're ah. a frickin' maven. I, I'm good yeah, at, at that stuff. If you asked me last week, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> uh, you're good at that stuff. I'm sure you know last yeah. week, too. All right, I was going to be ahead. my uh, my phone a friend if I'm ever on a game show where they let you call somebody for a hand. Yeah. Um, right. Oh, so, wow. Well. Get back um, to uh, Rice and uh, Gidry, please. So, Gidry, so Rice claims the MVP. Gidry uh, comes in second, and the vote wasn't particularly close, or it wasn't as close as a lot of people thought it should have been. Uh, and Gidry, this was the year that Gidry went 25-3, and three, which remains, by the way, the all-time best winning percentage for any 20-game winner. Uh, he pitched to an ERA of about 1.74, 1.78, something along those lines, um, close to 250 strikeouts led the league in shutouts, led the league in, in just about every important pitching metric there was, and, importantly, led the Yankees on their improbable and impossible comeback. This was the year that the Yankees were on July 4th, and Al, I'll, you'll check me on this, but they were something like 14 games yeah. out of first place. Yeah. And due to a superb second half, and, and let's, it should be said the Red Sox did not play good ball for much of the second half, the Yankees finally overtook and passed the Red Sox. Um, in the final week of the season, the two teams were tied, which led to the famous playoff and the famous Bucky Dent game. People know how that turned out. But over this final stretch, Ron Guidry faced the Red Sox three times. And again, it's, it's in the book. I don't have it in front of me to check. But he faced them three times, and I think he threw three complete games with two shutouts against them, and he, and he, and he won all three games. He, he collared the Red Sox. He owned them. Now, the Yankees took the pennant by one game, or the, the division by one game. Um, and Gittery, by the way, pitched in that final game as well. Um, it was his 25th victory of the year against three losses. Now, Jim Rice winning now, the MVP. Was, go ahead. What was the question? Who, did, who won the MVP? Jim Rice. Well, so Jim Jim Rice Jim Rice. named MVP. What were his qualifications? For well, he he hit the hell out of the ball. He was he was a slugger who led the league in most categories, most important hitting categories. He had a great year. He had a great year. He was yeah. in many Well, he was one, he was one dimensional. He wasn't a fielder. No, Jim uh, Rice was was a one dimensional slugger, but who who was helped immeasurably by Fenway Park. If you look at Jim Rice's career splits, home on the road, at Jim Rice, uh, sorry, at Fenway Park, Jim Rice was like the second coming of Ted Williams. On the road, he was the second coming, well, I should say the, he was the predecessor to Gerald Williams. He was two different players. Um, now, here's why the Jim Rice Ron Guidry vote is, is so interesting to me. Because you guys will remember, so Jim Rice is named MVP. There's some controversy in the air. The papers have had some, some issues with it. Okay, Ron Guidry was very diplomatic about it. He said, look, you know, I, I had a great year, but, you know, geez, look at the year Jim Rice had. You know, of course yeah. he deserves it. Um, Jim Rice uh, had some nice things to say about Ron Guidry, but also had some nice things to say about himself. <laughs> we move on. Well, the same situation in a sense, it's some similarities plays out eight seasons later, 1986. Roger Clemens goes 24-4 and four for the Red Sox, has a fabulous year. This is Roger Clemens' first great year when he becomes Roger Clemens. This is when he becomes the Rocket. Don Mattingly has a wonderful, wonderful year for the New York Yankees. Mattingly hits over 350 with 30-plus home runs, over 100 RBI, leads the league in slugging, leads the league in hits and doubles. 
uh, barely misses out on the batting title uh, when Wade Boggs decides to sit out the last four games of the season with a, a hamstring injury that miraculously healed in time for the playoff two days later. <laughs> Don Mattingly is uh, – it is assumed that, that Don Mattingly, certainly in New York, is going to be named MVP for the second consecutive season. Now in Boston, I think the assumption was that Roger Clemens had a really good shot. Well, as history tells us, Roger Clemens was named MVP in 1986, and it wasn't particularly close. He ran away with the award. Now this was, my gosh, this was one of the most contentious. The, the, the aftermath of this uh, vote was splashed all over the New York and New England uh, tabloids and newspapers. And Hank Aaron himself, he, he called the vote a joke. And Ron Darling of the New York Mets, the Game 7 starter of the, New, of the world champion New York Mets, Ron Darling said, I can't imagine how Mattingly could have lost. I don't think starting pitchers should be in the running for the, for the award. This is a starting pitcher saying that. Um, of course, in Boston, uh, McNamara, the manager, said, look, there's only one Roger Clemens. You guys saw what he did for the team, and I'm paraphrasing here. You know, where would we have been without Roger Clemens? And the fact is they wouldn't have won the division. They wouldn't have made it to the World Series. That's a fact. Those are So you look at these two seasons, and it's a tale of two seasons. In 78, the Slugger versus the Cy Young winner, well, they give the MVP to the Slugger. 1986, the Slugger versus the Cy Young, they gave it to the Cy Young winner. So it's just an interesting uh, look at how the voting has not always been very consistent and that, and, and if there are rules to MVP voting, they're not always followed. So that's my take. That's my long-winded take on the 1986, uh, uh, sorry, the 1978 right. MVP vote. That's a great take. Hey, Al, would you say that because of the year Roy Face had in 1960, uh, 1959, he was 18 and 59 one. 59, rather than. Um, yeah. They, yeah, they, finished, they, they finished. Uh, they finished fourth that year. They were two games over 500 at oh, 78, that's right. 76. The next year they. Henry, the next year they won. The next year they gave it to Dick Rote. Okay, because uh, yeah. 1960 was a down year in the National League as far as hitting was concerned. And right. since the Pirates... Except, the if, past, except if your name was Willie Mays. Except yeah. if your name was Willie Mays. And the Pirates, uh, you know, uh, wound up winning for the first time in 33 years. Not only did they give Groth the MVP, but the second finisher was Don Hoke. Well, yeah, you're Matt, absolutely right. Matthew was somewhere around 8th and ninth, I think, that year. But uh, Don Hoke, uh, well, you know, he's with the Pirates. He's a good player, but MVP? God, no. No. Not and, uh, no, and but a know, good player came from Brooklyn, played with Jackie in those days. Yeah, yeah, and they, they yeah. sent him to the Cubs, and these Cubs sent him to the Reds, and the Reds, the Reds sent him to the Pirates. But uh, uh, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, one of the things I learned out of Saber was to take things in context. So I always look at uh, you know what, whether it's an up year or down year for hitting, or an up year or down year for pitching. And, yeah, that's uh, a very important point. You, you yeah, know, 1960 think, was a down year for hitting. You, you need to look leagues. at the context. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was. It was. It, you need. You need. And I think that's so important when considering when, when you're when you're looking back and applying kind of today's perspective on things. Uh, it's important, I think, to to note what was happening in the game at the time. You know. Uh, John Evers, who was named, uh, who claimed a version of the MVP in 1914, was playing a very different game, uh, you know, than Andrew McCutcheon in 2013. John Evers was at the height of the dead ball era, and and you know he won MVP, he hit one home run, he drove in something like 40 runs. Oh, well, he but was like Billy really Martin. He was a 260 hitter who, when he got to his World Series, turned it up 10 notches. And he also did everything that was expected of a player in those days. Yeah, he did everything else really well, right? He was a fantastic defender. He was smart uh, as can be. He was tough as can be. Um, and the game has changed. So I think you, you, it's important uh, to, to keep context in mind. And I think 1960 is a great example of that because that often makes the top of the list. For many people, you go online and you see lots of lists, worst MVPs ever. And you're going to see 1960 Dick Grote in the top two, I, I guarantee it, in the top two or three uh, of any list 
of that, that any article that talks about the worst MVP. Um, and it's because if you look at you say, well, Dick Grode, he had a nice year. He led the league in hitting. He had 325. But then look at Willie Mays, who had, you know, 11, you know, wins above replacement. Well, there was no such thing as wins above replacement at the time. Uh, Dick Grote was uh, – it was a down year for hitting, so he actually was a fine hitter that year. Um, he was a leader of a team that was expected to go nowhere, and guess what? They went somewhere, and Dick Grote got a lot of the credit for that. Um, do I think Willie Mays was a better player? Of course he was. Of course he was. He was Willie Mays. Um, but Dick Grote, to me, is not one of the two or three worst MVP selections. Yeah, did you mention the name Max yes. Nichols, the, the, the Minnesota rival who voted for uh, Cesar Tovar in 1967 <laughs> and, of course, the uni, unanimity? Yeah, I did. And you know what I said about it? Um, I said that um, I'll leave it up to the reader to decide or to make their own choice as to the worst MVP selection of all time, but the single worst MVP vote of all time it's that. 1960. It's that, and yeah. it was. We're, we're allowed. Are we allowed to use uh, language on this uh, podcast? Absolutely, it's encouraged. <laughs> that, that vote was total <laughs> bullshit in any way. It was nonsense. This guy had an axe to grind. I don't know if he was a drinking buddy of Cesar Tovar. Cesar Tovar, for people who don't know, he was a utility player for the Twins. He played five or six positions, none of them particularly well. Um, he was a useful player. Carl Yastrzemski hit for the Triple Crown, 1967. This is in the deepest depths of of, uh, of an offensive drought. Pitching yeah. ruled the he game. Hit three, I think he hit 301. In 1968 right. was the bottom of that. The very call, bottom, yeah. yeah. I call that era dead ball two from 63 through 68. That's exactly right. And, yeah. and so Yastrzemski, he won, a, he won a batting title. I don't know if it was that year or the, the next year hitting 301. You're absolutely right, Ralph. Um, but he had a year that, given the circumstances, given the offensive environment, this was a year that was right up there with any that Ted Williams or Babe Ruth put up, okay? And he was named MVP. He was named on, I think, 23 out of 24 ballots, as he should yeah. have been. Um, and the 24th ballot was given to Cesar Tovar, who was essentially a bench player. And it's because this guy, Max Nichols, I think his name was, right? Was, yeah, uh, right. Uh, he had an axe to grind for some reason, uh, and so he decided to grind it with the MVP vote. Um, hey, you know, you got. I'm wondering. I, I know we're probably coming close to the end of our of our hour. Would you guys mind? Because you kept, you brought up uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Dodgers, and I know Allen's in Brooklyn uh, several times. Can I tell you guys a story about my dad that's related to baseball? Sure. Oh, please. And the Brooklyn Dodgers. So as we're talking. Please. So this, this, this is a story that, that really means a lot to me. And, and as we're talking, I'm actually wearing a replica Brooklyn Dodgers cap. You can't see it because we're on the phone, but I'm wearing a Brooklyn Dodgers cap. And the reason I wear this cap, one, it gets me in the big home, but two, I wear it as a tribute to my dad because his favorite team uh, growing up as a boy, he lived in Brooklyn, were the Dodgers. And he was heartbroken when they left, and he never got over it, but he adopted the Mets in his later years. Well, my dad passed away in 2009, and... It, was, uh, it wasn't unexpected. He had been sick for a long time. And I was working on my dad's eulogy. And this might sound a little weird to some people, um, but I actually asked my dad, you know, what were some of the things he would like to hear in his eulogy? And, and, and I asked him some questions um, to t- kind of tell the story of his life. And I said, Dad, uh, so who was your favorite president? Who do you think was the best president of your lifetime? My dad lived to 80. And he said, uh, without hesitation, FDR. Yeah. But okay. Yeah. I said, Dad, what do you, what's the greatest invention of your lifetime? And he said two things. He said, well, the invention that, that blew me away the most the first time was the television. My dad was born in 1929. And the second uh, thing that kind of blew his mind was the Internet, you know, 70 years later or 65 years oh, later. Oh, yeah, he lived to see place. that. Wow. Yeah, he lived to see that. So now I ask. Dad, who was your favorite baseball player? Now, I know the answer to this before I ask. My dad was a Brooklyn Dodger fan through and through. He saw all the greats play, he, right? He saw, well, the boys of summer that he used to go to the games. And he would talk about Jackie Robinson 
all the time. And when he talked about Jackie Robinson, a look would come over his face. You could see him replaying Jackie Robinson. You could see it in his eyes. He's replaying Jackie Robinson, dashing around the bases. Jackie Robinson with a beautiful hook slide. Jackie Robinson stealing home. Jackie Robinson spraying line drives all over the he loved Jackie Robinson, and he compared every player who came after Jackie Robinson to Jackie Robinson. Dad, who's your favorite baseball player of all time? Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> dad, wait, what, 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 are you, what are you talking about? And now my dad's in, in he, you know, he's in a hospital bed. He, he's, he's in a hospice now, so his time is drawing near. Dad, what, what do you mean, Joe DiMaggio? You, Jackie Robinson is your favorite player. And he said, okay, well, my favorite player is Jackie Robinson, but the greatest player I ever saw was Joe DiMaggio. And he said this as if he were confessing his greatest sin to a priest. Oh, wow. So, so in the eulogy, I told this story, and I said, Dad, I know you said Joe DiMaggio, but I think in your heart of hearts it was still Jackie Robinson, so we're going to go with that. Uh, by the way, there's a, uh, a Boys of Summer group on Facebook that I'm fairly active in, even though in those years I was a Yankee fan. Uh, my favorite all time was Yogi. And there was a story that, uh, was, yeah. there was a story that Carmen Barrett told that, uh, uh, they were, uh, Barrett's were at a, some function with, uh, Rachel Robinson. And Rachel Robinson, uh, asked Carmen if she could have a dance with Yogi. So uh, Carmen said, sure, and the Carmen called over Yogi and says, whatever you do, don't bring up that play in the <laughs> yeah. World Series. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think they argued that for 50 I think Yogi argued oh, that you, you, I, 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 We had a meeting at the museum a bunch of years ago, the Sabre meeting, and I asked Dale uh, Barra, I said, did uh, your father ever get as mad as he was on that play? And he said, only when we talk back to our mother. No. Uh, that's a great answer. That, that's a great answer. That's very indicative of the, their family life and uh, and Yogi's persona. Wonderful answer. Uh, rest in peace, Yogi. Well, hey, rest in peace, Jackie Robinson. Rest in peace, uh, your dad, Jeremy. Yeah. Oh, well, th- that's thank a great you story. Uh, thank you so much. And th- thank you so much. Uh, I had a great time. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Ralph, if you ever... If you find you ever need a guest again, I would love to come back because it's just it's Jeremy, just a hell of a we, lot we of put fun seven shows again. on a week on this network. If <laughs> what you're saying is true, you'll be on a lot. <laughs> it would be my pleasure. I, I really did have a blast. Um, Thank oh, you very man, much. That makes me happy, and I know Deeply it makes appreciate. Alan happy. We're, we oh, both well. really do. Thank There's you. There's a feeling and, it's uh, mutual. All right. Remember, it's Comfortably Zone Radio Network. Jeremy Lehrman and Alan Blumkin. I'm Ralph Tycho. Ralph, uh, David, I'll sign off and then I, I want to talk to you for a couple of minutes. All right, fine. Um, uh, d- um, uh, David Nemec? <laughs> no, I don't know. I'll call him and find out what happened. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, we, we manage. We manage. Yeah, I know, we yeah. His name. Let's talk for a second. We were joking the other day, um, Alan. <laughs> A, a prolific oh. guy. Well, let me sign off. Let's uh, do this offline, who, okay? Who is that? Who just came on? Tristan. Tristan, we'll uh, we'll see you in. Ju- We're going to sign off uh, on this show and call back in five minutes, Tristan. Sure. And All right. uh, Bye. we have okay. Tristan coming up. Uh, we'll talk to you.